This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to bigheadsmedia.com for more great podcasts. This episode, we spoke with Nita Tyler Mosby about inclusion in times of crisis and Joey Neal about living in New York City during the pandemic. Hi, I'm Eric. And I'm Aisla. And together we are the hosts of the Bicurian Podcast. Bicurian is our answer to the polarizing culture we live in. Tired of feeling under siege and looking for ways to get involved? Then come be a part of a different way of thinking. Everything from politics to geek culture to current events that polarize us as a society, we explore multiple ways of looking at things. Welcome to the show. Today we are doing a little bit of a special format and uh, a little bit of a special release schedule. There has been some news um, regarding... Uh, something that we've all probably been paying attention to, and in the last week it seemed to explode with COVID-19. Right. And and so we were talking, and we thought we'd love to have uh, Nita Tyler-Mosby back on the show uh, to just talk a little bit about some of what she's experiencing. So welcome, Nita. Um, Thank you. It's great to be with you. Uh, we wanted to have you on the show because of what you do in the world, and we're hoping you'll introduce yourself to our listeners and just share a little bit about what that is. Yeah. Well, I'm Nita Mosby Tyler, and I am the chief catalyst of the Equity Project. It's a consulting firm based uh, in Denver, Colorado. And I started the firm, frankly, because I wanted a way to have conversations across our country with organizations and communities about issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I wanted to be able to have them in a way that was a little different than we'd been historically having them. I believe in something that I call spaces filled with grace. I think there's a way to talk about even the most difficult things. And that's what my consulting practice has become, a way to have difficult conversations in a way that honors everyone in the room. That is brilliant. And I can imagine that right now, because, of course, um, part of what we're going to cover is talking about the impact of coronavirus uh, that you probably are seeing some very interesting things from the perspective of what you normally do. Um, maybe you can go into some detail on what you're seeing. Yeah, I'm actually seeing the best and the worst of us. You know, I um, everything from the president calling this the Chinese virus to people that have never been together coming together for good to help communities that aren't even their community. So I've seen everything on the spectrum um, during this time. But I have to tell you one thing about a crisis like this is in many ways, it equalizes people. You hear a lot about the mantra of we're all in the same boat. And then we sort of all look at each other and roll our eyes because we are, we don't feel like we're all in the same boat. This crisis has put us all in the same boat. And so you get to see people sort of galvanizing around fear or galvanizing around grief, it really does equalize who we are as human beings because we all are facing the same thing. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I don't think I've ever seen anything that I can recall in my life that is this much of a great equalizer because it doesn't matter if you're white, black, Asian, Hispanic, what country you're in right now, what um, you do for a living, what you do for a living, if you're rich or you're poor, um, you know, everybody is, has an equal shot of getting this. And, and I've seen some of the inequities that you've mentioned about, you know, somebody asked the president the other day why some basketball players had access to tests, but nobody else did. And so there's some, some equity issues in general uh, with a response, but ultimately you know, there's there's members of Congress as of the time of this recording that have been diagnosed positive, and um, you know, we have to acknowledge that that we are recording this and it's going to be released pretty quickly. But with the news updating every hour, yeah, it could, <laughs> like, it could feel no. like it's been a couple of weeks. <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah, there's obviously a lot of uncertainty right now, and companies are retracting. They're already doing layoffs. I'd like to hear a little bit about the ways in which inclusion work, which I could see not necessarily being prioritized, but I'm aware could be of a great benefit to to folks at this time. And I'm wondering if you could share some of some of those benefits, assuming you agree with me, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And it's interesting, um, historically and traditionally, when we talk about inclusion, 
we talk about it in terms of people being in um, the same spaces. And I think there's a way for us to think about inclusion differently because of this health crisis that we're in. You know, inclusion really is about how do we create um, win-wins for individuals while we're at the same time creating wins for organizations and communities. It really is the balancing act between those three things. And this crisis has had us to really pay attention to who are we doing things for? And so how many of our individuals in our communities can sense or feel a win in something? Or are we focusing too much on organizations having a win or communities having a win? So it, it's a balancing act that I think will force us into looking at our practices um, very differently. So when I um, initially was hearing a lot of the news about social distancing, I don't know that we thought about what the impact would be to individuals as much as we were thinking about what the impact would be to our larger system. So, you know, airlines started talking about, well, we're going to need some support and companies started saying we're going to need some support. But I don't know that we paid a lot of attention to what individual human beings were going to need in terms of support when this happened. So the power of inclusion is that you'd be looking at all three of those at all times. And this is a great opportunity to do that. Yeah, I agree. I, I work for a company that uh, is based in, um, we, have a, we have a large Colorado office now, of which I'm a part of. I was the first employee out here and now there's like 25 of us. And we have a Palo Alto office in Northern California and a Tel Aviv office. And one of the things that happened right away was that they did go to a work from home policy. In the U.S., we work from home on Fridays anyway. So it was easy to have an optional work from home process over the last few weeks. And then with the lockdown and all of the stuff going on, we closed our offices at the beginning of this first week here. And... I will say that I really hope other companies are doing what my company is doing. We have had everything from a virtual happy hour that was optional for people to log in and all see each other's faces around the world uh, to, you know, just like really just being proactive and trying to make it a comfortable thing. I, I've, I, I have a great amount of faith in my company uh, in a time of a crisis, just in how supportive they're being. I really hope other companies are having that experience. Yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, your your comment is so powerful. It's a great example of what I'm talking about with those three filters. Those, Your description really is a great model for a company that had a consciousness of, about individuals, the company, and the greater community. And that's what this is, this is all about. I think the minute individuals start to sense that our only focus is on the larger organization or the larger community, it isolates individuals even more. So we've got a risk a risk factor there that we'll have to pay attention to. I, I really have to tell you that I'm more concerned about how individual people are faring in this than I am what larger systems are doing. There's enough infrastructure in larger systems to make it all work out. But I worry about whether or not individuals have what they need to be equipped to face really a world that's filled with a lot of unknowns right now. Yeah, I completely agree. And it is, it's hard um, to even stay focused on work. Although, you know, I have been, there's, it's been a lot of business as usual. We, we were, we are a online platform for building websites and we've already done some things to uh, help out our customers who are who tend to be agencies who build websites for small to medium businesses. So everything mm -hmm. from um, helping them build, uh, you know, things at their various companies to help uh, restaurants that are still open, but can only do online ordering, or, uh, you know, pick up del and delivery and things like that. So we've been pretty busy because we are sort of an infrastructural thing where the web is where all the communication is happening. So again, yeah. I really hope other companies in various different areas are in the same boat. Mm -hmm. So what has surprised you most, Nita, in a positive way uh, fr from either your work or things that you've seen personally with the impact of the COVID-19 in community? I have seen kindness 
I have seen young people really look in on elders. I have seen people get very focused on philanthropy and charitable giving and charitable service. Um, at all-time highs. I've seen a lot of that happen. I have seen some of our big institutions, foundations like the Bonfi Stanton Foundation, the Denver Foundation, the Colorado Health Foundation, the Colorado Trust, and on and on and on, really step up and relax their very own standards to make sure that they are distributing funds to grantees in ways that um, cut out some of the red tape so they're being really responsive. When I look at what our healthcare providers are facing into yet making sacrifices for all of us, you know, I, I'm just awful proud to see um, what humankind can really be. So I don't know that I've been surprised, but I really um, have just been thankful and grateful to see that kind spirit that I knew existed in all of us. Yeah. Um, I hate to say that I'm surprised, but, <laughs> but in some ways I am. There hasn't been rioting, looting. Um, yeah. Mass hysteria has been kept fairly low. I mean, aside from people buying 20 gallons of milk that God knows what they're going to do with it in the next week or three before it expires. But in general, yeah. I have seen kindness. I have seen people um, being accepting. The only scary behavior I've seen is some people who have been flipping about, you know, I don't care if I get sick or this isn't a big deal and not really realizing the impact of if they get sick and spread it. But that's really the worst. And I guess that feels okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, it doesn't surprise me that you say that you're not surprised. Um because you could almost expect, if you were to predict what would be happening here, you'd almost predict a lot of hysteria and some of the things that you said. But I'm going to go back to what I said a little bit earlier in our conversation, and that is, this could, in fact, be the great equalizer. And so when people start to look around and notice that everybody is kind of going through the same thing, I think it calms the human spirit in a whole different way. And I see that happening now, and you're right. This virus doesn't care what color you are. It actually doesn't care how old you are. It doesn't care what your zip code is. And the fact that there is something that breaks through every single one of our disparate areas um, is equalizing. Yeah. And that those are the kind of things that bring us together when we truly can say we are in the same boat in a very literal way. So that's all positive, but, um, and, and I think this is going to become the set of questions that we'll ask a lot of the guests we have on, um, not to get dire, but what concerns do you have at this point? The concern that I have at this point is that I am not clear from a leadership standpoint um, with what our plan is here. I don't actually see a cohesive strategy and so while people have come together around this thing that they are sharing, the faith that people have in whether or not we've got a great remedy or a great strategy for how we're going to solve these issues, not only the virus itself, but how are we solving issues around, can we stay employed? What does social distancing, distancing do to almost every part of our infrastructure? That piece is where I'm disappointed and really nervous is I, I don't sense that we have a plan or an estimate as to how long we might anticipate this being our reality. Every day I hear a different number. I hear May, I've heard August, I've heard this could be a year and a half. So, you know, that's not calming to the human spirit at all. And some of it is that I just think there is a very disjointed strategy if there's a strategy at all. Yeah. yeah, I think that's really true. And um, hopefully, I mean, I do feel like slowly things are getting in gear. So hopefully that will continue. And so one of the things you, you were talking about were you call it spaces of grace is that it so obviously right now uh, you're not going to be going and presenting at conferences. How can people tap into the the wisdom 
and your spaces of grace. <laughs> if you're not able to go out, are you going to be hosting uh, uh, like on, online things or is there a blog or something people can look to? Like what is, how are you moving forward in this time to be able to keep doing this work that you've been doing to make a difference in the world? Yeah, well, I have to tell you, um, my my um, my heart broke when we started talking about social distancing because my organization, the Equity Project, is all about being um, together. So I've had to pivot quickly to make sure that we are still able to do the work that we've done beautifully across the country in a virtual way. So what we'll likely be introducing in the next week. Um, is an online presence where we'll do workshops and I'll keynote some things and have ways that we can continue to have dialogue, but we'll just be doing it virtually. And I've got a pretty strong uh, Facebook presence to Nita Mosby Tyler is how I'll show up on Facebook. And I've started doing something um, that means a lot to me. It's called From My Great Grandmother's Chair. I have a chair that my great grandmother left to my grandmother and my grandmother left to me. And I use that chair quite a bit to sit in, to reflect and contemplate things. And so I decided about a week ago that I would start to do some talks from that chair, conjuring up a lot of the things that I learned from my great grandmother and my grandmother. So I, I think I'm going to accelerate um, talks from my great grandmother's chair and we'll have those on Facebook. I might do a little bit of a YouTube channel out of that. So I think we'll have a lot of online presence until we can get back into some face-to-face -face dialogue with folks. And I also will do a selfish plug too for my book. It's called White People Really Love Salad. We and, love your book. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to yeah. learn more, you can listen to our episode where she talks about it. Yeah. <laughs> And so that's a precursor to probably the writing of a second book. It looks like I'm going to have some some quiet time to be able to write. So I've, I've got some other things um, in my head that I want to put pen to paper on. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much for giving us your time, especially at such late notice. We really, really appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, we'll stay in touch. And uh, I think... Uh... The, the sad reality is in these weird times, we'll be touching base on what we're doing maybe even a couple of weeks from now. So we can uh, we can touch base and see how it's looking as things progress. Awesome. Well, you both stay safe. And remember, this is the end of one thing and the beginning of another thing. And don't forget that there's something on the other side of this. And I wish you the best in it. Thank yeah, you. we wish you well, too. And thank you so much for being on. Okay, thank you. And with our new format, we are going to be trying to get in two guests just to give a snapshot of what's going on. So without further ado, our next guest is um, our friend Joey. So maybe you can introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Joey. I'm a, uh, a technical theater uh, consultant and worker in uh, New York. Uh, that is... Uh, also navigating the uh, uh, coronavirus uh, situation. So you are, and just to clarify, not just New York, you're in the city. Oh, yeah. I'm in. So I'm actually in Brooklyn, but I work in Manhattan. Well, I, I say so you're not was working, working right working. now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was working in Manhattan, um, uh, which is happening less and less. Uh, I say less and less, and not at all, not at all. And I um, think, um, you know, for the benefit of our listeners, we, we um, I would like to just say, so Joey is actually the child of one of our best friends, and you moved out there how long ago? Uh, a year and four months ago. I, I remember being at your going away party and, and how exciting it was, the time for you and all of that stuff, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I always kind of knew that if there was any kind of global um, pandemic crisis, you name it, that New York was going to be a part of it in, in some way, just because it's huge. People are in and out all the time. It's the biggest city New York in the U S. So it's like a really, that was a, that was a, that was a, I guess a risk that I 
knew about her that I was aware of when I moved. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so what's the, I mean, obviously the theaters aren't needing so much of the technical expertise these days, uh, yeah. being shuttered, right? Yeah. Um, kind of. So there's a, a shift in what, what live artists are doing. Cause a lot of, a lot of artists have started doing their shows, some form of live stream thing. And so there's this whole other side of the technical world that we're, that we're having to kind of break into at a very rapid rate. Um, and maybe and invent. In, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've been really uh, surprised how quickly everybody adapted to that. A friend of mine's band played yesterday streaming on Facebook. They, they, oh, had, wow. a, they had a gig scheduled and they just kind of set up a camera and jammed in their jam space live for everybody. So is that the kind of thing you're seeing? Uh, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of that. And there's also a lot of, of people that are doing um, uh, a little more or a little more structured uh, style shows. So where they actually have like audience participation and they're doing it. I have a, a good friend that we were actually, one of the things we're supposed to be doing today. Uh, he does a live improv show for kids. And so he just had like 10 kids in, uh, in a zoom call or a Skype call and just did like this improv show with puppets instead of his whole giant, um, stage show. Um, and that came just rapidly. It was like over the course of three days, we went from how do we live stream this to like doing it. Um, wow. Well, that's kind of good to hear that, that some of these artists are able to pivot so quickly into continuing to do stuff that uh, can reach people because the people are going to need it, frankly. <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, that's what, that's what I hear from, from a lot of people is that like, well, when there's, when there's really nothing to do, you're consuming art. However, that is that you do that, whether it's movies or TV shows or books or whatever. Um, that's, that's what there is to do right, right. now. Um, the last guest we had on, I, I will fully admit, and, and I haven't changed my opinion in the last couple of minutes. I'm genuinely shocked and impressed with how well most people are handling this and, and adapting and, and all of that. Um, how are you feeling kind of about that? You're in, you're in kind of an epicenter and a crowded place. I'm just curious how you're feeling. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm doing well. I'd be doing better with more work, but <laughs> I'm doing well. Um, there's not, for me personally, and this is very different from, I think a lot of the New York perspective. Uh, I, I haven't seen much of it. Like I don't, I don't really have any friends that are sick that may be due to moving a year ago and not having a lot of friends, but like, I don't have a lot of friends that are, are sick or know anyone that's sick. Um, so it's been, it's been really weird just going from one day working and thinking about it as this outside thing to literally the next day, being completely shut down. I'm, I'm pretty sure that is our universal shared experience. I remember yeah. last week I got up on Wednesday and was driving in and I was like, oh, there's a couple of cases, but it seems like we've got this under control. And by that mm -hmm. evening, um, Trump was doing his address, which didn't do much to calm everybody down, but simultaneously NBA canceled. And then that started like the domino effect Ooh. the next day. And it was like, suddenly we went from, I was, I was at work on Thursday and we work from home on Fridays anyway. And we were kind Ooh. of wrapping up. I was like, well, if they close the schools, I think, you know, we might think about working from home next week. There's 25 of us in the office in Louisville, Colorado. Ooh. And what was really interesting is on my drive home, I heard them talking about what it would take to shut down schools. It was complex math. If this many students in this school got sick, then they would shut down this part of the district or sp specific districts. And I got home and two hours later. It's like everything shuttered for two weeks. <laughs> so <laughs> it was rapid. Yeah. So uh, I was listening to the news as you do 24 seven at this point, apparently. Yeah. And, uh, they were saying New York is considering a shelter in place edict mm -hmm. Wait, in the next probably 24 to 48 hours. If that happens, 
what do you think that'll I mean you're already kind of like shut down but you guys could still move yeah. about like how do you expect that to affect things um it's it could it could change a lot i know a couple of people that have as as soon as they said the word the, the words shelter in place they uh rented a car and got the fuck out of the city because <laughs> they because that was just what they they decided to do um those like like the you know we see we keep bringing up bigger and bigger words that are scarier and scarier and it's starting to cause a like an emotional change in things and especially after people have been already holed up and anxious anyway like it's just the a whirlwind of emotions are, are starting to move like me and me and the the guy that works at the the bodega around the corner we've uh, been talking for several months at this point uh and we are barely barely interacting we're minimal minimal interaction in and out <laughs> yeah um, are you thinking about leaving the city or are you pretty settled uh, no, in? no i've i've decided that i should just stick around um just just because it, being from New York, there's no way for me to get from here to anywhere else without major contact with a lot of people. Mm. Yeah, uh, I, th I think that's a reality that's just, as well. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you mentioned before we uh, actually uh, you know, brought you on the show, we were talking a little bit offline, um, that you have six roommates? I do. I have six of them. Which, and, which just seems like an interesting situation to be in because you're not related. Yeah. You're not you know, hanging with the family as it were, mm -hmm. how's that situation going? Um, I think it's, it's a little bit different because we're relatively new, uh, roommates only a couple of months, but it is, it's been great because they're, they're great to hang out with all of them. Um, we've been kind of nightly hanging out and then kind of reconnecting over the day and talking about how we're coping with things and that kind of thing. It's been lovely. Um, we spent a couple of days, we actually have a, a yard here. We spent a couple of days working out there and just like existing with it. It's been, it's honestly kind of nice. Six people is enough that I can be with different people over the course of this. Whereas if you've only got one roommate or if you don't have any roommates, that can get really like tight. Yeah. How, how have they been handling things? Like, do you feel like they've been behaving safely to protect your household yeah yeah we we had a we had a massive uh long meeting one night about how we're going to interact with uh leaving and entering and visitors and that kind of thing like how we're we're handling those things um that sounds really smart yeah so communication and respect these yeah, are these yeah, are good things been, <laughs> it honestly like i'm i'm so grateful for the people that I'm with because yeah. I think we've been handling it uh, really well on the communication side of things. That's great. Uh, what surprised you the most in a positive way about things as they've been unfolding? Um, in a positive way. <laughs> yeah, like with this um, thing you were su pos surprisingly the, positive, you know? Yeah, I think it's the 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 people's dedication to what they're trying to do like they're they're either whether they're specifically in my case whether they're performing a show or seeing a show their dedication to seeing someone do whether it's whether it was for a little bit there we were able to operate at half capacity and people were really good about knowing that like we may or may not get into this show because it's half capacity. And even though they bought a ticket, they're letting the, the artist keep, um, keep that ticket um, instead of like fighting over refunds and that kind of thing, because mm. that's what it is. Yeah. And what are you most concerned about? There's, there's a part of me that is worried about with with tensions rising and anxiety rising and like the panic starting to set in a little bit there's a, a fear of like other people's reactions in the broader community that it's just going to get like really tense and angry for a long time um 
going into and out of this. Um, but I think I think that's about it. I mean the the biggest the biggest worry for I think everyone in an artistic position, especially in New York, is the fact that we're not working and we're not getting paid. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that is a that's a massive stressor on a lot of people. Like that's um, I did, like I know a lot of people that are going to be really really fighting next month to find any, something or anything to either get paid or to to like unionize with the other tenants or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. Because that's yeah. a it's a big that's a big fear for. I think everyone in our position. I, I think, yeah, I think a lot of people are that, and especially, you know, mm -hmm. you're in the, the, you're in the service industry for specifically things that are shut down. Like, it's not yeah. even like, um, I, I found out a restaurant that we've been getting takeout from primarily to help support them down the street, um, was so busy now doing takeout and pickup orders, um, that they called back in chefs and stuff. And so it feels really good because they're sort of, again, everybody's adapting, but it's, it's, it, I see there's definitely a lot of areas such as your line of work that we don't even know what it could look like. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that the governments and everybody will take that into account. The good news is I've heard there's moratoriums on hopefully, you know, rent and things like that. You know, the evictions are not allowed. So that's good news, I guess. Yeah. That's nice. And they just did in New York, they just announced some kind of, I haven't, I haven't done a whole lot of research because it was just um, maybe five or six hours ago, but they were, they were talking about a 90 day suspension of mortgages, which could mean uh, landlords being a little more lenient with um, rent. One would hope. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> if like, they don't have to pay their mortgage, I mean, they should not make you pay rent. It is unprecedented <laughs> times, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that you want to add or thoughts you have to share? Words of wisdom? I don't, I don't think so. Nothing, nothing pressing. Um, well, we hope you stay safe out there and uh, really appreciate you having on the show, you know, having come on the show and, and spend some time with us and um you know we'll be checking in i unfortunately the reality is i don't think this is ending anytime soon so the truth sure. is we'll maybe check in in a week or two and do another show and see where things are at if yeah. you're up for it so great yeah that'd be great that'd be great and thank you for inviting me and having me on here uh i, I appreciate it yeah absolutely well stay safe and uh keep in touch with your mom and let everybody know what's going on all right. Thank See you. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for listening to our show. This is going to be a new format that we follow to get some of the stories out there of the things that people are experiencing. We aren't settled on a schedule yet as the world is kind of a little bit uncertain. We've decided to embrace uh, the flexibility of that uncertainty and try to get the things out there that we can in a timely fashion. Yeah. So anyone who has any feedback or whatever, please let us know if you have any interesting stories and would love to be on the show at this point, we're accepting any kind of submissions as well. So, and uh, you can find us um, on most podcasting platforms. We're also available on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, medium at by Curian is our handle everywhere. Yeah. And uh, you can always give us a call at 720-507-7309. You can leave a message there and we can get in touch with you or email us directly at podcast at com. If you like what we're doing, tell your friends about us, share the episodes you find most interesting. Thanks.